give an overview of um, the SEAI grant system and the inspections that we carry out in KSN Energy. So I'll give a bit of background on the process of the grant and the different stakeholders involved in the grant system with SEAI and then some of the things that our inspectors would see on site, more common sort of things that they'd come to bring to, you know, to bring to people's attention. So the first thing is, you know, why are we installing heat pumps? Um, well, the aim is to move towards a low carbon energy society, sustainable, secure, affordable and clean energy. As everyone knows, we need to use less energy and we need to use clean energy. We need to develop new solutions to meet our energy needs. Um, a lot of people will ask, you know, well, you know, there's a lot of people look at today when it comes to a heat pump and kind of go, you know, when we look at carbon, when it comes to gas boilers compared to heat pumps. But we really need to consider when we look at a heating system, how long is that heating system going to last? So typically a heating system, whether you're getting a new boiler or a heat pump, whatever it is, normally we'd estimate that it's going to be there between 15 and 20 years. And the environment and how we get our energy and how our energy is supplied in 15 and 20 years is going to be a lot different than how we get it now. So whilst electricity can be you know, can use a lot of fossil fuels at the moment, it's going to become greener and greener over time. So that's why the importance of a heat pump comes into place. What's driving it from SEAI's side? Well, one of the biggest things to drive it is the Climate Action Plan. For those who don't know, the Climate Action Plan was published in 2019. It, um, it, it, it recognises Ireland must set, significantly step up its commitments to tackle climate disruption. Uh, it sets out ambitious course of action promoting the widespread adoption of heat pumps, which is a key thing for today. Um, already we've lost, you know, I see it, we can see from our side, from the, the, the section of the industry that I'm in, we, we've already lost probably two years at the start of the climate plan from COVID. Things have slowed down, but our things didn't start as they would have hoped to. But we can drastically see things ramping up on our side. And it is going, you know, it, it's gone, it might be slow to start, but the targets are huge with regards to heat pumps. Before 2030, half a million homes have to be brought to a B2 cost optimal level, which requires an awful lot of work to be done to homes. 600,000 heat pumps, of which 400,000 are to be retrofitted into homes, have to be installed. That's a massive task. And... What it means to people is it's a huge opportunity for small and medium sized businesses. It, it is going to be a big growth industry over the next few years. So who are the key stakeholders in it? It's not, you know, people sometimes think, oh, heat pump, I get the plumber out and he installs the heat pump. Well, when SEAI look at the grant system, they would have looked at the history of heat pumps and perhaps they got a bad name, you know, a number of years ago, probably, you know, at the the end of the Celtic tire, perhaps they were going into the wrong type properties on it. So for to satisfy the needs of SEAI grants, SEAI asked that there's three key st stakeholders on it. Firstly, the person needs to go to the home to assess the home. You know, it's not just a case of putting a heat pump into any home. So they have a role there of a technical advisor and the technical advisor makes the assessment of the home. And I'll go into a little bit the technical advisor's role. The next person is the person to size the heat pump and design the heat pump. And then finally, the installer comes and he installs and commissions the heat pump. So there's three significant stakeholders in the installation of a heat pump. To give a bit of background on the technical advisor, firstly, the technical advisor, what do they do? They look at the fabric performance of a home. They look at the ventilation performance of the home. They look at how to achieve what's known as the heat loss indicator, how, how that will be achieved, or if possibly it is achieved on the home, they will give homeowners general advice about heat pump systems and other energy saving features. So who is a technical advisor and what's their role? The first thing to become a technical advisor, you have to be a BE or assessor with a level eight qualification. It's another industry that we see 
where there's probably a lack of supply at the moment on it as well too and talking to other people in industry as well they probably you know relate the same uh, message that they're finding it difficult to get them so there's probably growth in the technical to, to people doing the technical assessments the what they do is they will go in they'll take a home and they'll see is the house heat pump ready to do that they will determine the heat loss indicator i'll cover that in a moment they will detail so if the house look you know the house might be poorly insulated it doesn't mean it's not suitable for a heat pump it might mean though that things need to be done maybe the windows need to be changed maybe the walls need to be insulated attic needs to be insulated so their role is to go out and to uh, to, to assess the home and make sure it's heat pump ready and what they do is they focus on the building, the fabric and the ventilation of the building. They don't look at the heating system. That comes afterwards. They, they look at the house and make sure that the house is suitable for a heat pump. So the heat loss indicator, this is a, probably a term that SEAI have come up with. As I said many, many years ago, heat pumps probably were fitted in homes that maybe weren't suitable and people just had excessive bills. And... The reputation of heat pumps probably came down because of that. People coming in saying, oh, my ESB bill is thousands or whatever it was. And it's, you know, it wasn't as economical to run. Heat pumps need to go into the right type home. Uh, you can see from the image there on the right hand side, heat lost through a home in various different ways, through the walls, the roof, the windows, drafts, ventilation, through the floors. The, um, the heat loss indicator is a measure of what SEAI deem is what's the maximum allowed heat loss in a home? Where what what makes a home most suitable? What's the maximum amount of heat loss that the house should be losing for to before you install a heat pump? So what the the assessment will do is it will go into a home. They will use the deep software they'll carry out like they, they will enter it typically as they would in, in, in on a BER assessment and they will take the total heat loss and they will measure it per meter squared of the house and what that means is for every meter squared of the house it should be no more than two watts to raise that house by one degree per meter squared of the house now there's loads of ways that you can recommend to do it it might be installing air tightness in the home removing some of the drafts it might be a case of doing the attic the walls the windows there's loads of different ways to, we would say look you know two and two is four and three and one is four also it doesn't you know there's no prescribed way there's no one rule suits every home and that's where the technical assessor will come in and they will determine what's the most practical economical and the easiest way what suits the homeowner best to do their upgrades to achieve what's needed to get the house heat pump ready so that's that's basically kind of a brief introduction to what the the technical assessor's role is after the home has been deemed ready fit for having a heat pump installed on it the next person is the design size and assessment needs to come into consideration so for the purpose of SEAI grants, um, the first thing is the, the heat pump has to be able to deliver 100% of the space heating needs. That means, you know, you can't kind of say, grant, it'll heat the house, but we have to put the fire on as well, or we need to have a backup boiler or anything like that. The heat pump has to be able to heat 100% of the space heating on the house that's one requirement that SEAI have the second one as well too is it only needs to do 80 percent of the hot water the reason why it needs to do 80 percent of the hot water is heat pumps tend not to be as efficient when the temperature goes over 45 degrees so that last little bit of heat because the drop off in efficiency SEAI say grand if it can heat 80 percent of the hot water that's satisfactory now with advances in refrigerant gas, high temperature heat pumps are coming, you know, the market's changing a lot. So these things are always changing. And I suppose from our side and from an inspector side, keeping up with technology sometimes can be difficult. Um, the next thing, um, what's the responsibility of the register or the design? Who's responsible for it? So the heat pump contractor, they have the role of, they, they have to take responsibility of the design 
of the system. Sorry, I'll just flick back there. When we say the system as well, too, it's not just the unit. It's not just a case of coming in and putting the heat pump in. They must look at the hot water system. They must look at the control of the hot water. They need to look at the heat emitters, whether it's underfloor heating, radiators, you know, fan coil units, whatever sort of heat emitters are doing it and what control is on it. So that all of that is encompassed on the heat pump contractor, the registered contractor. They need to carry out, they, they need to take a home and they need to assess the heat loss of the home room by room. Um, they need to also assess the heat emitter in each room to ensure it can deliver such sufficient heat at lower temperatures. They need to look and make sure that the heat pump is sized adequately, that it's not too large or too small, because too small and it'll be overworked and the efficiency will go down, too large, same scenario will happen. We want SEAI wanted to keep it to maximum efficiency, optimum efficiency. They need to, to do that. They need to enter the data into deep because heat pumps aren't, you know, they don't give a, a, a constant efficiency. It depends on the scenario that the heat pump is fitted in, or installed in, the home it's fitted in, the uh, temperature it's run at. So there's a lot of different factors that determine the efficiency of the heat pump. So to, to do to determine the efficiency of the heat pump, SEAI required that it's entered through deep to get that efficiency from it. They also need to do what they typically would do when installing any heat system. They also need to take into consideration, you know, where am I going to put the hot water tank? Where will I fit the outdoor unit? How am I going to get pipes across? What controls am I going to go in? So that, that encompasses the role of the heat pump contractor on the design side. Then... Um, I suppose the heat loss calculation, historically, you know, um, as Stephen said, I'm in this industry 25 years, probably, probably more. Um, when I started in the heating industry, we would have used a rule of thumb and we would have taken the length and breadth and width of a room and multiplied it, got, got the size of it in cubic feet and multiplied it by five. And that would have, that was what I would have used to size a radiator that would have given me the amount in BTUs and then I would have got a radiator conversion chart and I would have looked it up and said this radiator will give x amount of BTUs and it's suitable for the room and that's how I would have picked that radiator we are looking at you know we've come on a lot not every room is the same you know homes are well insulated poorly insulated we might have um, a mid-floor for an example, if you had a mid-floor apartment, it's going to be a lot different than a bungalow. The two rooms can be identical. They can have the same amount of external walls, same windows, same room volume. But one of them, you know, the bungalow, if we give it as, as an example, may have no floor insulation and no attic insulation. And that apartment would be have, have another apartment down below heating. So we'll assume that there's no heat loss through the floor there. And the apartment above will have heating. So we assume there's heat, no heat loss there. So the demand for heat in a room can be different and we need to be a bit more accurate about how we do it. And rules of thumb are no longer sufficient. So when someone goes to size it, SEAI ask that it's sized to a recognised standard. There's four examples of recognised standards here that I have. One is the SIBSI Domestic Heating Design Guide. The next one is SR50-1. That was the code of practice for domestic plumbing and heating. Um, SEAI have a room heat loss and radiator size and guidance and I have links to these and I'll have them on the document and I believe the document's going to be shared out with people so if someone wants to look them up at a later stage I, I have links there and the last one is the SR50-4 which is the heat pump uh, SR so any of those four methodologies is acceptable to SEAI um, the next thing is it's important to consider the working temperature when retrofitting the heat pump um, we need to look the efficiency. I don't know if it's this graph. I don't know if it's difficult for people to see, but if, as an example, what I have here on the the left hand side or the y axis, I have an example of uh, on the chart. It has the range goes from two point five to five. Basically, what that is, it's it's kind of the equivalent. The term efficiency isn't used when describing heat pumps coefficient of performance or COP is the term that industry uses to describe in the efficiency. And basically what that means is 
if we look and kind of go, okay, if, if we take three, um, if the COP is equal to three, that means for every unit of electricity, you're getting three units of heat back. So for every unit of electricity that goes in, into the heat pump, you get three back out of it. And we can see a heat pump there, um, and I, every heat pump is slightly different and dependent on the refrigerant and a lot of other factors. The efficiencies change, but just as a typical example, this heat pump here, if the flow temperature was run at 35 degrees, basically what you're going to get is for every unit of electricity, you're going to get four and a half units of heat coming back from it. Whereas if we looked at, if we wanted to run it at 50 degrees flow temperature, we're only getting three uh, COP of three. So it's drastically, you know, it's, uh, you know, if typically gas, the price between gas and electricity, gas is normally a third of the price of electricity. So heat pumps run at high temperature may have no cost savings to the end user on it. So design is really important. If we can design a heat pump to run at low temperatures, that's where we'll get the heat pump working optimally. Um, when it comes to sizing the heat emitters, look, underfloor heating is great. It's low temperature anyway. The next thing, low temperature radiators, you know, fan coil units, they, they can work at low temperatures, typically 40 to 55 degrees. For air systems, for an air to air heat pump, the SEAI, you know, they, they're given on it and they, they're part of the system. So the sizing of that, doesn't really matter too much. But when we look, if we were to, you know, the, if you were to go in, because our, the industry I'm involved is retrofitting, and a lot of times people will retrofit a heat pump where an existing heat pump was there. So it's important to understand how a radiator, you know, the output of a radiator is governed by the average temperature of the radiator and the heat of the room. If we took that snip there is from a radiator sizing chart and you see manufacturers will state what the flow and return temperature of a radiator is, or they might put it in the Delta T. They have a couple of different ways of describing it, but they will, we can see that, you know, 75, 65, which would be a conventional boiler, standard efficiency boiler for that radiator, which is, um, Okay, it's 400 long, it's probably probably 400 by 400. You'll get 600 watts of heat out of that. But on a reduced temperature, perhaps if it was a heat pump, it's only 318 watts. So in some cases, it may be, you know, people may need to replace radiators. Now, historically, radiators tended to be oversized. So there's a little bit of a buffer there on it. And another thing that we find is in combination with the installation of a heat pump, uh, insulation measures or heat loss reduction measures that happen at the same time. So sometimes the load is reduced as well at the same time. There's the link there for anyone uh, in blue at the bottom, if anyone wants to look for SEAI's guidance on the um, heat loss and radiator sizing. Uh, the next thing then, how, how do you calculate the delta T? So the formula is there. So basically it's the flow minus the return or plus the return temperature. So it's the average temperature of the radiator less the room temperature. And that will give you what's known as the delta T. So that's another way the manufacturers describe, you know, the, the output of a radiator. They might have flow and return temperature or they might have delta T. But again, you can see when we look at a non-condensing boiler, run at those temperatures to delta T is 50 degrees. Where we look at a typical heat pump system, it's only 22 and a half degrees. So that's where, you know, that's where it's very important that the radiators are sized adequately. The next thing on the hot water, um, the, the designer needs to consider the hot water system also. They need to look at the reheat time and they need to agree that with a customer, you know, the amount of people in the home, how much it's used. They need to make sure that the, the hot water tank is adequate for the homeowner's needs. They also, same principle as with the radiators, the heat exchanger. And this is where, I suppose, from an inspector's side, they cringe when they come in and see a standard cylinder because they have a little bit of extra work to do. They have to try and calculate the size of the coil or heat exchanger in the cylinder. 
to see that it's sufficient. Whereas typically when they go in and see a manufacturer's indoor and outdoor unit, they know it's sized because the manufacturers sell, sell it properly or sell it sized correctly. The insulation has to be sufficient on it. So minimum, it has to be part L compliant. So minimum 50 mil of factory insulation has to be on it. There has to be uh, means uh, of Legionella prevention. Again, Legionella, I think is about 55 degrees. Water stored below 55 degrees has a risk of Legionella. The heat pump is probably heating the hot water to about um, 45 degrees. So there needs to be some means that at least once every two weeks that the water gets heated to 60 degrees or higher. And the manufacturers controls generally control that. But sometimes we do see, you know, there might be an existing cylinder there. The heat exchanger is adequately sized. And what an inspector will look for in that case is that there's some sort of time control, possibly for an immersion to raise the temperature there. Yeah, with regards to the controls, there's a minimum level of controls required for, again, this is all for SEAI grant side of things. You must have separation of space and hot water heating. There has to be load and weather compensation. And as a minimum, there needs to be one space heating zone with a room thermostat or at least a sensor to measure the thermostat. That table there, it shows for the different types, is it has a bit more detail on what controls is needed for um, the various different types, air to water, ground source, exhaust air, air to air, different types of heat pumps available on the market. In the link there in blue, SEAI's technical standards and specifications, if anyone wants to look into it further, that, that link will take them to the download page where you can look at the section there for heat pumps on it. So that brings me kind of to more our side. A lot of that is worked out before we get out on site as inspectors. Um, with KSN, when we're carrying out inspections, I just probably have a few bits. I don't know um, if, if we have installers here. If we have, the first thing I'd advise as an installer is to, um, to have a look at what the questions an inspector uses. So these are available. This is... Um, what we'd advise everyone installing a heat pump for a grant is, is that they download the inspector's questions, they take them through and they use it as a snag sheet. It's like if the contractor could imagine if they were an inspector and inspect their own work. What I would advise anyone to do is, is to take this and to go through it question by question and just tick it off and kind of go, grant, yeah, I have that done, I have that done, I have that done. And that generally we find with someone with a good QA system that incorporates that into their QA system, that they can, um, they tend to have less reworks than maybe another contractor on it. Again, the link is there. If someone wishes to go into it, they can print it off. Now that document has every measure and every question that every inspector has for every measure that SEAI grant aid on it. Depending on what measure you install, you know, you might only be um, interested in that specific section. The kind of that sheet that I have there, it's you can see in the top, or hopefully you can see in the top, it's page one or three. So it's only a sample, but if you want to have a look into it further, as I say, if you click on that link, it'll give you more details on it. So the actual process itself, firstly, not all homes grant aided are selected for inspections. Inspection rates are typically based on an installer's performance and experience. It, you know, a good performing contractor that's experienced on the scheme would not receive the same amount of inspections as someone possibly new to the scheme that maybe has had a couple of inspections and has been number of non-compliances with that inspection. So it's risk-based. That's how SEAI select homes for inspection. Um, it's not meant to catch people out. Sometimes people will be there kind of going, oh, here, you know, how am I supposed to keep up with it? As I said, the, all the inspectors' questions are there. And there are mentoring inspections available. So if someone wanted to contact SEAI, the inspector can meet them on site. And typically these are offered to a contractor who would register first. Um, the offer will be made to a contractor to ask them if they would like to go to site with an inspector and do a walkthrough with them. And the inspector would give them their phone number and say to them, look, if you have any questions, you can contact me. Again, there's a link there to the inspector's questions. Um, 
the, where a non-compliance is observed, um, what we would do is we'd send out a request following the inspection. We'd send out a request to the contractor to rectify the issue sent by the installer. So that's what we call the reworks process. Now, should an installer feel whatever rework was highlighted is unjustified, there's a, a, you know, there's a process there that they can appeal it. Sometimes maybe someone came in and done works afterwards, changed something, done something detrimental to it. So it does happen on it. So there is an appeals process there available. Um, these are, these, you know, we've seen many, many different things over our time carrying out inspections. But um, there's no point in me trying to cover every last little bit. But what I wanted to do was look at what the common, common reworks, as we would call them, so one of the things is siting of the outdoor unit. And this is where a homeowner would try, we, we, the, 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 kind of the cause of this tends to be where a homeowner thinks the unit's unsightly and wants it kind of hidden in and out of the way. But again, I keep repeating the words, heat exchanger. The, the outdoor unit exchanges heat in the air and makes it into useful heat that can be exchanged into the home. If it's a case that it's too close to a wall or someone puts a fence in front of it or something like that happens, what happens is it disrupts the airflow coming through the, um, the outdoor unit and it limits the efficiency of the system. So we, we stress to everyone just to make sure that, you know, an inspector will go out. They typically know what the tolerances are from the manufacturers, but they will reference it if they see one that's too close to a wall or something like that. Also servicing needs to be considered. Um, that's one thing that we would see when we're carrying out inspections on site. Um, another thing that we can see is we, um, we probably have the benefit of coming out of maybe a couple of months. I'd say on average, we're out about two months after the installation. And little things might not seem big at the time you're installing it, but over time, they can turn out to be a nuisance. And you can see from the image there, you know, that heat pump and the water coming down, it's caused a fair amount of staining on the ground. Um, the staining, okay, it's cosmetic. The biggest fear is, is in the wintertime, there's, it can turn to ice and someone could slip and hurt themselves on it. So what we would ask is to pipe it to either a drain or a, a gully. In cases where drains and gullies aren't that accessible on it, we, we would uh, recommend just getting a soak away. So a soak away, you can buy them in most of the plumbing merchants and they're just purpose-made units, like a small pipe with porous holes, four-inch pipe, porous holes, and it works like a French drain. So there's a number of different options on how to terminate it. Um, I have this one down as unit level, probably a better description. I should have described it as unit, not plumb. It's not the case. If we were looking at that side on, and it was a little off level, it wouldn't be as big concern. The big thing for us is the unit run like that. It's got the motor, it's got the fan on the motor, but it's going to cause excess wear on the bearings on it. It can cause noise. Um, it can limit the lifespan of the unit. And possibly, you know, you might get uh, warranty issues with it as well, too. So it's key that these units are mounted plumb. Um, earthing, um, earthing and bonding, this is one that um, it comes up a lot. Um, for an SEAI installation, SEAI asks that all the earthing and bonding is done to the National Rules for Electrical Installations, IS 10101. And typically, whilst there's an earth on that cable, we would ask that all the cables are cross-bonded and linked together. Uh, next thing from an electrical side, like the picture probably, you know, I probably don't need to describe it much. It's messy. It's there. I've small kids, the footballs and slitters knocking it around the back garden. I know those cables wouldn't last long in my home. And that would be a thing that an inspector would come across. And he'd, you know, he would ask that the contractor return and tidy up the cables and secure the cables and remove them. They're a trip hazard or, you know, you could get a live electric cable if it snaps out of it, probably fuels protection, but you know, that that would be the, something that an inspector would highlight at the time of inspection if they seen it. Um, another thing is insulation. Um, we want to get the heat into the space with minimal losses. It 
It doesn't matter if you have the most efficient heat pump, if the energy is being lost before it gets into the home. So the insulation, the quality of the insulation and how it's installed is really important. I have another image here. And as I said, we're typically about two months out after the installation is finished. And if you look at that there, I don't know whether it was birds pecking on it, whether it's just UV from the sun, you can see the bottom of the heat pump, that's a monoblock one. So the bottom of it there, there's no insulation on, on the pipes. That's all lost heat. That's all money. That's energy. That's CO2. That's all being wasted. And if that's like that after two months, what's it going to be like in 10 years time? So that would be another thing that an inspector would look at when they're on site. Um, the next one here, I get the purpose of why an installer does this. It's putting an isolation valve on an expansion vessel. And as everyone knows, when you heat water, it expands. That expansion has to be taken up somewhere and an expansion vessel is installed to take that up. I've had it myself where I'd have gone out and someone has said to me, something's not working. And do you know what? We had a leak in the house and I just ran into the hot press and I turned off every valve and I thought I turned everyone back on. And it hasn't worked since. Expansion and uninterrupted expansion is essential for the safe operation of a system. If it's a case I get for maintenance, people put them on, that instead of draining down a whole heating system, if the expansion vessel has to be changed, you put them on. What we would say is if you could fit a, um, you know, a, a valve, a lock shield valve, something you have to use as a tool for to isolate the expansion vessel. Um, that, that's what we would recommend, or better still, nothing at all. But if someone does decide to put something on that it can't be accidentally turned off, then the safety valve. So from that last slide, perhaps what's happened, someone turns off the expand, closes the valve to the expansion vessel. System can't take up the expansion. The system overpressurizes. That water has to go somewhere. There's no one, you know, Every, every home is different and every way to deal with a safety valve is different on it. So there's no one magic rule that you can say, do it exactly this way and it'll satisfy the inspection every time. What I would advise everyone is that what the inspector looks for is, is that the safety valve is safe and visible. So that's the two key things. So the image on the bottom where we see that pipe coming out horizontally. So on that one, we'd ask, an installer just to put a bend it's just to minimize risk you can't eliminate risk always but what we want is to see the risk has been minimized where that top terminates horizontally if the system overheated the um, you know it's gone up to 100 degrees pressure built up in the system and it blew off there's a chance that maybe someone's outside it blows off and they might get a burn off. Whereas by putting the bend on it, pointing it down towards the ground, it minimizes that. The next one there where you can see the copper pipe, I've circled it going into the white pipe. This is where we look at being visible. So if you imagine, you know, everyone knows their overflow pipe sticks out, the soffit comes from the tank in the attic. The reason why it's put in is to let someone know they have a problem, that they have an issue there ball valve is stuck, the floats, punctured, whatever it is. And the idea is to notify the home homeowner, the occupant, that there's an issue before it becomes a bigger issue. Now, in this case, that's not I have to, I'll have to go quicker. No problem at all. <laughs> um, yeah, just with regards to that one, I was just going to say, like your overflow pipe, you have to be able to see it. Heating systems don't like fresh water. And if water has been lost through the safety valve, fresh water is going to come in. And I've seen it in the past where maybe a heating system pitching and radiators have only lasted a year. They've rotted from the inside out. So it's important that if there is an issue and the safety valve is, you know, is blowing or dripping or whatever it is, that the homeowner can see it. Typically, what we would say on the image on the rightmost side where you see what we would say, and that is if there's a ton dish, and someone could see it, and it just means they can see a drip coming from the safety valve. But unfortunately, on that side, they haven't piped it to anywhere. So I can only assume from that picture that that's located indoors. So if something happens, there's going to be, you know, water damage that's going to flood the place. So there, 
they're kind of key things when it comes to the safety valve. Um, the next one, just again, as I described, I'd have two boys playing out in my back garden and they would have their football or their hurls and slitters and they'd knock them in behind something like that and they will climb over everything. That one there is refrigerant pipe work. It's soft, it's easy damaged. And what we would say is that it would need to be protected, you know, clip to the wall, tidy, you know, and same with the cables in the image. Um, this one here, just two issues on this. Um, you can kind of, as you can see those red arrows, um, the area over the radiator is going to be warmer than the room itself. Therefore, the position of the statch, it's not going to give a true representation of what the temperature of the room is. So we'd ask people just to consider when installing stats that they, they're, they're not on top of radiators. Another thing would be in a kitchen where maybe there's a, a cooker and someone puts on the oven and the kitchen gets nice and warm, but the rest of the house is cold. It needs to give an indication of the overall temperature of the house. The second one is that there's, um, I, I, I colored them in the kind of greeny colored squares. And I don't know if you can see it from the image, but there's a thermostatic radiator valve and there's a statue. But putting two thermostats in the same room, it will cause a conflict. One, whatever is set to the lower temperature is going to determine the heat that comes in that space. What we would say is the room stats to give, or the wall stats is to give an overall indication of the temperature of the home. Whereas TRVs are useful for single room. Uh, temperature control so in that case we'd ask that only you know that there's no t or v fitted on the room um like that um they're only you know obviously these are only some things that we come across but um they're more common they're the more common ones and that's what i said i you know kind of present or bring to everyone's attention today they there are all, all those things there are on the inspector's checklist so you know, you'd see it if you download it, you can go through it and they will be all the checks that the inspector will do. So that's why I strongly recommend if you are installing to download it, take it with you to every job, just tick it off. You're just walking through it as an inspector. I would have done inspections myself. I would have done thousands of them. I would have gone into homes. I could do it nearly in my sleep, but I, as I would have taught to myself and I'd pick up the checklist at the end and I'd go to tick things off and I'd say, oh, I never checked that. So even with the most experienced doing them, we still would forget them, to, you know, to forget to check things sometimes. So that's why I'd encourage everyone, you know, if they're doing it to avoid reworks, it can delay payments as well too, and it can be an inconvenience to installers. So just to try and kind of grease the wheels if they use that inspection checklist, that helps things go through. Um, that's that, that's everything that I have, Stephen. Um, I don't know if there's any questions or anything like that or... I'm um, happy to take questions if you like. Perfect. Yeah, um, there was two questions. I'll have to go through the the other, technically the other meeting. That's um, but uh, I can send on the questions afterwards, and we can get back to whoever asked them as well. So, yeah. Um, if that's okay, unless anyone else has a question now or. Sorry, I had a question, um, and, and it was, you mentioned that there was a, um, you know, the heat pump must be sized to 100% of the space heating needs and 80% of the domestic hot water needs. So those are uh, peak loads, and are they simultaneous loads? Um, do you know what? I'll have to double check it. Normally, I don't think they are simultaneous um, because... Typically, they, they, with a heat pump, it gives priority to hot water, to heat the hot water, and it tends to be done out of kind of hours is the way they're set up. So I'm 99% sure, but I will confirm it just to check that for you. Okay, that's great. Thank you. And um, I, I think I had a, a, the other question that, uh, you know, the other, the other 20%, what's the assumption on that, that that's coming from an immersion? Typically, yeah, uh, typically generated by an immersion. Okay. And now, what happens, as we see with the development in refrigerant, they're, they're 
newer or heat pumps coming in the future can deliver 100% of the load for the hot water. But it, it, just as part of SEAI's grant, they only ask that it delivers 80% as a minimum. Okay, understood. That's perfect. Any other questions um, from anyone else? Okay, that's perfect. So I'd like to thank uh, Matt for today. Um, it was interesting. Sorry about that mishap halfway through. <laughs> wi Fi and working from home, you know the way it is. So, that's uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, and to everyone that joined as well, thanks very much for coming and um, we'll be resuming our webinar series next Wednesday uh, at the same time again, quarter past three, sorry, quarter past one, should I say, and also on Thursday in quarter past one as well. So again, thanks very much to Matt and everyone who joined today and I hope you have a pleasant evening. Thanks, thanks very much, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.